We continue on today in our series of American Idols, and today we're going to take a look at the choices that we make concerning entertainment. Most people would say that um, movies and music and magazine, television, video games has very little influence on them. Yet billions of dollars are spent each year through the media. We, um, we want to fill something and um, so that we can think and act a certain way. But man has always been longing in his soul. Man's always been looking for something that will satisfy him. And um, entertainment seems to most as the best way in order to satisfy that hunger, that thirst for satisfaction in life. Uh, people keep on looking for this satisfaction. But the truth of the matter is, it all boils down to really two things in life, and that is you can live your life with a passion for yourself and a passion for pleasure, or you can live your life as a passion for God. Um, you either live to please yourself or you either live to please the Lord. That's really what it boils down to in life. You can say uh, that you go in one of the two areas. The Westminster Catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And my friend, that is a passion for God, a fervent desire for God. And I do believe in the day and time that we live in that people have rewritten that to say that the chief end of man is to glorify man and to enjoy himself. I believe that's the way that man has written it today. But in my opinion, I would tell you that in preaching this message today, uh, of all the ones that I've preached on the American idols, I would tell you that I think that probably Christian people in our churches today struggle more with this God of entertainment, this American idol, uh, perhaps with, than any other one uh, that they struggle with. And so I want us to look at three things about this American idol of entertainment. First of all, the experimentation of, of uh, entertainment. As we have uh, experimented with what makes us happy, and we all have, we have become a society of instant gratification. Here's the philosophy of America. The philosophy is, if I want it, it's good, if it makes me feel good, it is good, and I want it, I should have it, and if I should have it, I want it right now. That's the philosophy of America today. I think that we've come to that point, and uh, that is that it's instant gratification. We desperately want to be entertained. Pleasure becomes the end of the existence. I'm gonna mention several things, there's a lot of things, but I'm gonna mention several things uh, today. Uh, one, we are looking for entertainment from our television. And uh, I don't know whether you know the facts about this, but the average home in the United States of America watches four and a half hours of television a day. It is on, uh, the TV is on for eight hours a day in the average home. Uh, housewives watch 36 hours of television. Preschool children watch 54 hours of television a week. That's an average. Can you imagine that? By 18 years of age, there will be 11,000 hours spent in a classroom by the time that they turn 18 years old and 22,000 hours of television watched. Twice as much television watched as what they spend in, in time in a classroom. Television shows have become one of the biggest topics that people talk about today. And, um, in work, at play, at school, and even at church. And yet television has been the major cause of, in reality, a, cle a complete collapse of our m moral society. Uh, you can lay a lot of the blame uh, towards television today. By the time that a child graduates high school, they will have seen somewhere between 18,000 and 30,000 murders and 200,000 acts of violence. They tell us that the ratio of unmarried to married sexual activity on prime time is 11 to one. And so it's 11 to one uh, a corrupt. Immorality, it's so rampant on TV shows today that you can't even trust the, the kids shows anymore. Uh, some of you have probably been reading and I heard over the last couple of weeks uh, that even the Muppets have become corrupt. Can you believe it? 
Well, you know, of all things, the Muppets finally going to corrupt. But it's true. It's true. You look at it. They're dealing with sexual matters and promiscuity and all these uh, different things. And uh, we need to, we need to, parents, we need to be wise and aware of these things that are taking place. Carol Lieberman, a uh, um, psychiatric, psychiatric uh, consultant for TV, she states this, that TV is destroying the collective American consciousness. And I agree with her. This woman, uh, she served as a consultant for more than 35 TV shows, trying to uh, instill a sense of reality into them. And this is what she states. The boob tube is not a supplier of entertainment. It is a shaper of distorted values, a dispenser of shallow beliefs and a leveler of aspirations. And I think she's absolutely right. right. We are looking to television for our entertainment, but should we ask, is that what we're getting? Are we truly getting entertainment from that? The truth is that we are trying to escape, escape reality through entertainment. And we're giving ourselves over to other people's ideas, religions, and their, their corrupt ideals of life in reality. We need to guard. We need to be careful of that. Also, we are looking for entertainment from our, our games. Now, if you know teenagers, if you know any teenagers, you would understand that the God of video games is on the ascent. Is that not true? And uh, you young people don't think, oh, brother, pastor's getting on games here. Look, I'm not saying games are wrong. I'm not saying that. You're going to understand what I'm saying in a minute. But I would tell you that some children spend hours of day, uh, hours of the day trying to knock down whatever strange shack the angry birds are chirping about. And you know that it's true. I watch my grandkids do that. Many teenagers and even adults are immer uh, they're immersed in virtual worlds divined by some computer um, uh, pixels with their true identities lost in the impersonations of some elf or some uh, uh, ninja warrior or something of that nature. Uh, uh, that is taking place, but some enthusiastic uh, uh, gamers known as extreme gamers, they tell me that they spend up to 48 hours uh, a week in playing games. They're in front of that monitor begrudgingly leaving only to go use the bathroom or get another energy drink. It's astounding, you know, they're, they're engulfed in that. Listen to me, what I say, nearly one in 10 children between the ages of eight and 18 could be classified as clinically addicted to video games. And that's the world we live in today. Uh, young people that are addicted to these things. We're looking for entertainment from our social network. Some of you older folks say, yes, get those young people about those games. Well, what about you on your Facebook, you know? Spend all that time on the Facebook. And I'm not saying Facebook is wrong, but John Piper put it this way. And I think he put it in perspective. And uh, if, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I tweeted this this week. But John Piper put it this way. One of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from a lack of time. And you know what, he's absolutely right. You've got all that time to spend on Facebook and, and all these different things and in the computer, but yet you say, I just don't have enough time to pray. Well, we're looking for entertainment from our sports. I'm trying to, I'm hitting every era here, aren't I? And uh, so uh, I know some of you big sports fans out there, you're a different team, and I am too. You know, I love my teams that, that, um, and hopefully they'll win. But if you look back in history, you'll find that men have always elevated sports into a position of a god. In fact, you go back and look in Greek history, you will find that many mythical gods uh, represented different sports uh, uh, characters. But Americans have been overtaken with the American idols of sports. They're overtaken with these things. More time, more money, more talk, more passion is directed by many Christians towards the sports arena than they are about the things of God. And you know that you know that it's true. I would tell you that some Christians have absolutely no problem in spending money on expensive tickets, on jerseys, uh, uh, in, uh, other paraphernalia in the sports world. 
but they not only do not give a tithe unto the Lord, they don't give anything to the Lord. You know, they want the church to be here for their children and their grandchildren of the days to come, but yet uh, the, I would dare say to you that there are churches across America today that are closing down because people don't have a passion for God, they don't give anything, the church can't pay their bills, and the doors are closing. And you know that's true. But yet they have money for the things that they want to have money for. But yet they don't have a passion for God. They don't have a passion for the things of God. They don't have a passion for the house of God. And so as a result, the doors are closing. Some Christians don't have a bit of problem in talking about their, their team and what their team did yesterday or going to do today. But they struggle in giving out seven little cards we've challenged our church to give out a card and all you need to do is say, look, if you have any questions about life and about eternity, you can go on truelife.org and it, you'll find all the answers that are there right there. Of course, we know the answers are in the Bible, but in truelife.org, they give a good representation of the Bible of how a person can know, come to know Jesus Christ, their Savior. Seven, seven cards is what your pastor has challenged you to do over these seven weeks. And, uh, so it's sad to say that too many parents are more concerned about the development of their child in sports than they are about their spiritual development. And that's the world we live in. I'm talking about church people today and even sometimes in uh, uh, education. You know, the sports even comes ahead of that, certainly ahead of uh, uh, spiritual um, things of their life. And, that's, and we know that's very evident by the money and the, the time and the emphasis that is placed on children's sports programs today. We know that's true. But also, we are, we are even looking for entertainment in our politicians. Can you believe that? I mean, it even bleeds over into the political arena. Uh, we want that. We, it seems like we have come to expect that leaders uh, of all kinds uh, should have an ego a mile wide and uh, that many have come to expect our leaders to be self-serving. That's the world that we've come to here in America. And after all, if our leaders don't have huge egos and they don't reward themselves handsomely, how do we expect them to be able to manage the entire country? That is the mindset, I believe, in our world today in America. That's where we are. And all I'm trying to say about entertainment today, Christian, in this first point, is that the Lord God has often been left out. He's lost out on this when competing with the gods of entertainment for our time and for our attention. That's where we are. And I think we ought to ask ourselves the question, what does our family spend the most time doing together? I think we ought to ask ourselves that question. That's a valid question today to ask. What do we spend our, our time doing together. Our own false gods tend to be invisible to us. We like to see in what uh, other Christians, their gods are, but their, ours tend to be invisible to us. We, we often see the American idols that other people are serving, but what about the ones that we're serving? While some families build shrines to their football teams, others are dominated by cars and music and antiques and even Hummel figurines. I don't know what it might be. It might be a lot of things, you know. Uh, yesterday, I took Jack back out to uh, the barn where you ladies did such a marvelous job and loving on my wife for her birthday. And uh, so um, I took Jack to his mom and I was walking around with Katie just for a minute. And we walked through the antique section. Most of y'all know she's three years old. And I said, Katie, these are antiques. And I said, can you say antiques? And she said, no, not yet. I'm still learning. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know what? We shake our heads at people on the other side of the world that, that worship their gods made out of stone and wood and metal and all these things. But yet we have things that in our homes that I need say that that I think a lot of people are worshiping because they put all their time, all their money, all their effort into these things. And these things are far more important to them. But let's move on to our second point. You say, thank the Lord. Uh, let's move on to the enjoyment of entertainment. You'll like that point, okay? 
And I, I feel like I need to push the pause button on this point because uh, I fear that many of you may begin, think that I'm beginning to sound like I'm legalistic here, what I'm having to say. And I'm not trying to construct a tower of rules uh, on this, uh, nor saying that entertainment is evil. I've not ever said that all along. You remember I've said from the very beginning of this series, and I've repeated it over and over again that you might know that, that our God is a good God and he wants to give us good gifts. And he is the God. Again, he gives us uh, again the uh, food and sex and entertainment. All these are gifts from God, even in the sports world. The Bible talks about sports. The Bible tells us to run a good, good, run a good race. And uh, talking about the race of life, but it speaks about these things. But the truth of the matter is, God has made so many things, so many things wonderful and beautiful in this life that they entertain us. We're entertained by these things. My wife and I had the joy this summer of seeing one of God's beautiful creations, and that was uh, uh, the Niagara Falls. You know, some of you have been there and uh, you, you, you can't help but just look at things like that and say, you know, God is an awesome God. You know, that he, he creates these things and there's, you know, there's no way, you know, we could do things. Kind of reminds me of, you remember the, the Texan that was up there, you know, how they think everything, they, everything in Texas is bigger, you know, and better. And uh, I don't know if we got any Texans here or not. But uh, he was up there with a New Yorker, and the New Yorker showed him Niagara Falls, and I said, and he said, I bet you don't have anything like that in Texas. He said, no, but we've sure got a plumber that can fix it, you know? So, <laughs> so you know, God makes some beautiful things. He does. Many of you love taking your kids to the zoo and uh, seeing the animals, you know, and uh, they're, they're entertaining, you know? The kids love it, you know? They, they love being around all these different things, and you know, when we slow down just a little bit in life, our life is so fast paced in the way that we're moving. If we'll just slow down a little bit and take time to look up the, the stars and the moon and all of God's creation that he put into place, you can't help but marvel at this beautiful entertainment that God gives us. I try not to ever let there be a morning uh, even after I've prayed, but when I drive off in my car in the morning, I look up at the skies, whether it's raining, whether it's cloudy, whether the sun is out, whether it's cold, whether it's snowing. Sometimes I do go out of Florida now, okay? Whatever it might be, um, I look up and say, you're an awesome God. You can create these beautiful skies and this beautiful day that you've given to me to be able to live for you. We, we serve a, a, an awesome God. And that's what Paul says. He says, trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That's our God. He's a good God, amen? He's given us so many good things. So what's the problem with entertainment then? You know, what is it? Well, let's move on to the third point, the, empty, the emptiness of entertainment. And I would tell you that Solomon answers that question. One of the greatest figures of the Old Testament here and he pursued entertainment relentlessly. He's looking for pleasure. That's what Solomon is doing. Read through the book of Ecclesiastes. You'll see it there. There in chapter two and verse one. I said in mine heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. Now Solomon has incredible wealth. He has incredible power. And he spares no expense in order to entertain himself. Whatever is out there, he wants to experience it. And I'll tell you that we should learn from him, not of all these things he did, we should learn from the mistakes that he made. And Solomon gives us this so we can learn from his mistakes and we should uh, learn from them. And so first of all, I want you to see that it leads to disappointment. All these things of this life, it leads to disappointment. We live in a disappointed world. You think that's true? We live in a disappointed world. Would you believe that study shows that 10% of the British people believe that they'd be better off dead? 10% of the people believe that they'd be better off dead. 9.6% of all Americans suffer from depression. That's the world that we live in with entertainment more now than we've ever had, but yet people are more depressed, don't want to live, one general, uh, journalist wrote this, my career as a journalist has afforded me opportunities to interview stars 
including NFL football greats, movie actors, uh, music performers, best-selling authors, politicians, and TV personalities. These are the people who dominate the media. We fawn over them, pouring over the, uh, pour, pouring over the minutia of their lives, the, the clothes they wear, the food they eat, the aerobic routines they follow, the people they love, the toothpaste they use. Yet I must tell you that in my limited experience, I have found our idols are as miserable a group of people as I have ever met. And this is a guy that's around him all the time. He said, all these people that have all the money and all the fame and, uh, and all these things, all the ability, they're the most miserable people I've ever met. English essayist Charles Lamb said, I walk up and down thinking I'm happy and knowing that I am not. That's a picture of a lot of the world. You know, I know I'm not. I know I'm not happy. There are Christians that are sitting here in this pew today and you're not happy. And there's a reason for that. Solomon soon concludes that there's no lasting joy in entertainment. That's what he concludes. He tries pirating, go read through all the book. He tries all these things. He tries supplying himself with everything he can think of in order to fill the void that he has in his life. And he has the money to try everything he wants to try. It's not like there's gonna be any limitation financially because he has it all. And so he spends all this money. Ecclesiastes chapter two and verse eight tells us that he, he brought in a choir of men and women and of course a harem. Most people have heard about the harem. We're talking about all the wives and concubines that Solomon had. So we know that there was the women from every nation. There was food from every culture. There were books of wisdom from every civilization. It didn't make any difference from around the world. He has all these things. Solomon covers all the bases and he's looking for some meaning in life with all these amusements and uh, he's going to find it. Uh, he's going to find this pleasure even if it kills him. I'm gonna find this pleasure. That's the attitude of Solomon here. Reminded me of the, the young man I told you about in our service last week of Lamar Odom basketball player on some of, I think some of the championship teams of the uh, uh, Los Angeles Lakers, maybe even the Miami Heat, I can't remember. I know he played for them, uh, played for several teams, not playing for a team right now, uh, what, two weeks ago that went on a binge of women and, and drugs and drink and all these things. And, and as a result of it, he went into a coma and um, uh, they said now that he had 12 strokes uh, you know, uh, the, on the, from this four-day binge of, and reality of entertainment uh, in his life, of trying to, I'm sure, trying to fill a void, you know, the emptiness in life. And, uh, you know, we can have a, we can have a hateful uh, attitude about things like that, but the poor man needs Jesus. That's all he needs. The poor man needs to know the truth. And there are a lot of other people out there that need to know the truth. Where does it all end? Solomon tells us where it ends. And uh, chapter one, verse two, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, it's all vanity. In other words, what he is saying, it's all meaningless. Every bit of it, all that out there, it's all meaningless. And then it brings me to our second point, it leads to disillusionment, not only disappointment, but disillusionment. Has all the American idols fulfilled us as Americans and satisfied, satisfied us? Do you see a, a group of people in America today that are satisfied? I would submit to you that I see a group of people in this modern world of technology that are, are less satisfied than we have ever seen in the history of America. And maybe in the history of the world, a group of people. I recently found a little interesting article uh, it said great truths about, life's, uh, about life children have learned. And uh, we need to learn some great truths about life. Kids learn these truths. This is what they wrote down. When your mom and dad are mad at each other, don't let her brush your hair. That's what she learned. Never ask your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato. Or you can't trust dogs to watch your food. Don't squeeze or don't sneeze when someone is cutting your hair. Or don't hold a dustbuster and a cat at the same time. You can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. 
or no matter how hard you try, you can't baptize cats. That's what kids have learned, you know? And y'all, some of y'all have learned that too, but Solomon learned some great truths about life as well. That's what Ecclesiastes is telling us. And he gives us a heads up on where pursuing pleasure will ultimately lead us. It's what he tells us. We've seen all the bait and switch tactics in the temple of the gods. We talked about that last week. And they offer us the sky, but yet they give us the mud. Is that not true? If you're looking for your, all your happiness in life in these things we've already dealt with, with sexual pleasure this life, with food and with entertainment, my friend, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to tell you sex becomes shame, food becomes an insatiable hunger, and entertainment becomes a restless boredom. That's what happens. You become bored with it. Um, I mentioned in the first service, and I'll mention again. <laughs> And I'm a little reluctant to say it because we have so many people work at Disney World. If it weren't for my grandkids, I probably would never go to Magic Kingdom again. And some of you say, Pastor, I don't know how you can say that because I'm tired of it. That's the reason why, you know. I've been there quite a few times and it's the same old, same old, you know. That's the world we live in. That entertainment somewhere or another, it just doesn't satisfy, you know. Especially when there's a lot of crowds there. Especially when it's hot. My pastor friend Herb Hubbard came and uh, we were over in, in Epcot for a while and we went over to Magic Kingdom around noon. And uh, so uh, my wife and I were there. It was in the summertime, it was hot and Herb was there with his family. We were there, I bet uh, maybe, uh, maybe not even 30 minutes. I said, Herb, I love you brother, you're my friend. I said, enjoy your time with your family, I'm going home. You know, and I left because <laughs> I just couldn't handle all that, you know, and it was too hot, too crowded. I didn't want to deal with it. Well, that's entertainment for you. Have you ever wondered why so many people are bored today in this age of technology? I bet you didn't know this, but boredom didn't, uh, that word boredom didn't appear in our English language until the industrial age. It wasn't even there. You don't know what you're talking about. I'll tell you what, the way some of you older people were uh, raised up. If you were to, you know, you hear a lot of kids today say, well, I'm bored. You hear that a lot, don't you? And uh, I try to tell my grandkids, don't say that. Just don't talk about being bored. You know, that's, there's a problem there and we want to we wanna head that off right up quick if we can. But uh, life's too, too wonderful to be bored, truth of the matter of that. Yeah, and God is too good to be bored, you know. But, you know, it's just a common thing. Kids hear it everywhere. They hear other kids say it, and so they say it. But um, I tell you what, some of you older folk, if you were to tell your dad when you were out there working on the farm that you were bored, you want me to tell you what your dad would tell you? Son, I'm going to give you something that you're going to forget about being bored. You know, or I'm going to use a board, you know. <laughs> That's what the older generation would have heard. <laughs> and they wouldn't use that word anymore, now would they? <laughs> but yet the word amusement actually comes from the world of worship. I, didn't know, I don't know whether you're aware of that. But um, amusement has as its root word there, muse. The muses were the female Greek gods who were said to inspire writing and science and artistic achievement. They were the gods of reflection is what they were. Um, the muses. And when we add the A as a prefix, it means the idea of lacking is what it means. So amusement is the lack of inspiration, the lack of reflection. It's what it is. So lack, it's the lack of inspiration, lack of, reflect, of reflection. And so we seek amusement because why? In reality, we don't want to think. It's the reason why. We want to relax. We don't want to think. We don't want our minds to be in gear. A few years ago, Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. That was the title of the book. And he argued that the po popular culture is dumbing down our world at a startlingly fast rate. And I believe, I believe, I mean, we have more knowledge today, but we're being dumbed down in our world. It's amazing how people can't think for themselves. They allow other people to think for them. And Christian, 
Let me tell you, be careful. I'm telling you as your pastor, be careful of how you let the news media think for you in this world. You better be careful. There are so many lies out there by our news media and our politicians today. You better learn to think for yourself. You, you better learn to read and you better learn to find out what the truth is rather than just listening to what, what people have to say. I'll tell you, there are a lot of our politicians out there that say that they're one thing, but their whole life shows that they're something else. And you know what? Our world's so dumbed down, they believe them. I just can't believe it. They, they believe these things. But we, we find that, you know, the, 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 um, this title of this man, the amusing ourselves to death, it captures the power of the American idol of entertainment. In reality, it does. And it promises us life, but it takes our life from us one 30-minute sitcom at a time. It's sapping us of our life, of where we are and, and what we are, who we are. And Solomon pursued pleasure in entertainment. And he concludes when he comes down to the end of it, my friend, that it leaves people disillusioned. And they're empty. And they're disillusioned. And, and uh, I would say to you, in this entertainment world today, we are more disillusioned than we have ever, ever been. Solomon says in verse 14, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, if this isn't in your notes, it's going to come on the screen here. Write it in there. Never in the history of humanity has there been so much entertainment and so little satisfaction. People aren't satisfied. More entertainment today, less satisfied. Which brings me to my third point today is it can lead to deliverance. I find it interesting that Solomon uses that phrase, under the sun, 29 times in this book. You'll go through and you'll find it 29 times under the sun. And he has looked everywhere at everything under the sun and he's tired and he's frustrated. His sights are set too low, my friend. His parameters are too narrow. I would submit to you that he's searching for it out there and it's not under the sun, but it's above the sun. What he's looking for is above the sun, but it's not under the sun. He's looked under the sun for all these things. I think C.S. Lewis um, captured all this when he said, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. A baby feels hunger, well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim, there is such a, a thing as water. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it to suggest the real thing. In other words, we're never... We're never going to be totally satisfied until we get to, to heaven. Christian, that's true. But ultimately, gods of pleasure, they can't satisfy your desires. They can't do that. So we come to the realization of what we need, and it cannot be found in sexuality or through the stomach or through amusement. We want pure, unadulterated joy, and the trail finally leads to God himself. That's the only place you're going to find it, my friend, is if you want total satisfaction in this life, you have got to go to God. He's the only one that can give it to you. And Solomon, in Solomon's diary, he reaches this conclusion at the close of his book in chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You want to boil it all down and you want to have satisfaction, then you better fear God and keep his commandments. That's what Solomon has to say. Write it down. I think it's in the notes here. We were made for God and until he is our greatest pleasure, all other pleasure in life will lead to emptiness. It's true. All of the rest of it will lead to emptiness. All the wealth, the health, the happiness that we could ever achieve will bring it will never bring satis total satisfaction to us. 
It is only as we view all that we are and all that we have and all that we ever hope to be through the glasses of grace and to see that God has given us all these things for our enjoyment till we come to this point. If God has graciously given us all these things, if God has done that, how much more important, my friend, would it be to keep God in the middle of your date book and your checkbook? If, if God's the one that gave us all these things, how important do you think that it is to do that? I think it's very important. I think it's a must. Abraham Maslow said, without exception, I have found that every person who was sincerely happy, radiantly alive, was living for a purpose or a cause beyond himself. And he's right. Solomon seems to say here that the more we enjoy, now you say, well, I enjoy the, the, the entertainment out there. But hear me, Solomon says, the more that we love the giver, the more we'll love the gifts. You know, there's a, we can enjoy. Hey, we have a good time. My wife and I, we have some great time together. I tell you, there's nothing any greater in life, and some of y'all experience that and spending time with your family and your, your grandkids watching these little ones come up again. We get so much joy out of that. We're enjoying this season of our life. We really are watching these grandkids come up. It's what, what a blessing. And you know what? That's entertainment to us. You know, I like watching Jack play those games yesterday. Even he's being entertained, but it was entertaining me. <laughs> you know, watching him do it. And, uh, but you know, but let me tell you the reason why I can really enjoy that is because I love the giver. I love that giver, which is almighty God. He's given us such wonderful gifts. And we enjoy these gifts because they are graciously given to us for our enjoyment. God gave them to us. There's a place in our life for relaxation through various forms of entertainment, including sports and television and movies and music and games. And, but the question is, now listen to this question. I think that it's a very important question for us to contemplate. Do we seek to fill the spiritual vacuum inside of us with empty entertainment? Or is it the inter empty entertainment that is creating the vacuum? That's an important question. I think you need to think about that. Because there are a lot of Christians, and some of you that are sitting here in the pews today, there's a vacuum in your life. There really is. It could be the entertainment that's creating the vacuum. You know, it's kind of like uh, which came first, you know, the chicken or the egg, you know? But parents, let me say to you today, and even grandparents, it'd be sad to get to the end of our life and realize that all the pleasures of this world that we sought to give our children only left them empty. Because if you're not giving them the important thing that they need, I'm gonna tell you all these things that you go out to have fun and do entertainment with them will leave them empty. They'll be empty in this life. You'll move on out of this life and leave some children, some grandchildren in this world that are empty because you didn't give them what they needed, and that was the giver. Show them how to love the giver. Show them that your life is invested in the giver. Show them that your talents, that you're using your talents for the Lord, that you're using your treasure, you're giving a tithe unto the Lord, you're using your time, that, you're, that your kids seeing you hand out those cards and being a witness for the Lord. All these things, that's how you invest and your children and your grandchildren. How do we smash these American idols? Let me tell you something I experienced many years ago as a young person in Haiti and I had forgotten about it. It was really a rough trip that we took. I think I was 20 years old. It was um, uh, a rugged mission trip. And um, we, we flew into Port-au-Prince and we traveled um, in the back of a truck, uh, two hours up into the mountains there in Haiti. Very poor area, no, no, um, no running water, no electricity. Um, I spent the night when we ultimately got to our place where we were going into a little grass hut that the rats were running in the ceiling all night long. Some of our guys slept out on the ground outside because they didn't want to deal with that. 
and woke up the next morning to tarantulas that were around on the outside of where they were. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a difficult trip, but I remember on our way, we stopped in a, a really, uh, a lot of the towns were, you know, a little bit more lovely, a little bit more peaceful, but one that was, seemed to be a little bit more dangerous. And we stopped there and um, we um, um, preached, and uh, believe it or not, on that mission trip, I took a trumpet. I used to play the trumpet, and I played the trumpet. And all of a sudden, uh, the missionary that we were with came to us, and it was getting dusk, and he said, uh, we need to get out of here and get out of here quick. Get in the truck. And so there was an uprising that was going on there. We got out of that little town. We traveled for a while, and we came to another little village there. We got out. We are going to spend the night there, and there was a church building there that... Um, they had um, a, a little auditorium. It was made out of concrete, believe it or not. And we weren't all the way up in the worst part of there. Still no electricity in this area. And, uh, but it was made out of concrete. And um, it had windows and doors, but the windows and doors weren't in there, if you know what I mean. There was a place for them. And uh, very poor building. It had, a, had a, a classroom all from the auditorium. And that's where we spent the night. We spent the night there. 5.30 in the morning, I heard something that really stirred my heart and I will never forget it. People from all over the village and outside of the village have walked there to that church building and the church building was full of people. And they were singing praises to our God. And it was a beautiful sound like I had never heard before, and I don't know that I've ever heard since of that particular sound that stirred my heart. That morning long before they did whatever work they were going to do that day, they spent time in worship and singing to their great God. And you know, while I was there, very primitive, we had church service out on some, just some sticks out there underneath the grass hut of the ultimate place that we went. And the service would go on a long time. Those people, they'd sing, they'd sing, they'd sing. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they would sing forever. Teach, preach, go on two, three hours. And the truth of the matter is, I think back in America that, you know, if you were to go more, more than an hour here in America, people start looking for a different church. And you know, it's true. You know, you, you go too long and, and people, people are offended by that. And, uh, but you, let me just tell you, you know why those people worship God so long? I could give you a real spiritual uh, uh, reason, but I, I don't want to give you a profound answer. I, I just want to give you a simple answer because it fits with my sermon today. And that is because they had no TV, no phone, no computers, no theaters to go to. Absolutely, really, uh, as far as made up entertainment, they didn't have any of those things. And so God didn't have any competition. There's no competition there uh, in that land at that time. And I wonder what it would be like in conclusion of this message if we would take time for an entertainment fast to where that maybe for, maybe for five days, maybe even for three days, if you would just consider, I, I'm just asking, I wonder what it'd be like if in our homes that we would do that and we would turn off the television and we'd log out of Facebook, turn down the music, un unplug the, the, the game console and just turn our eyes towards the Lord. I wonder what it'd be like for our homes to spend a long, uh, more time praying sitting there with your children, reading a book, reading a chapter in the Bible, then read, maybe read a book. Maybe a good Christian book to them, a life of a missionary or something of that nature. Praying. If we just learn to pray like David prayed. I read it to our membership class this week and it still stirs me. David said, thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. 
and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might. And in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come from thee and of thine own have we given thee. God's so good to us. What have we given to him? I submit to you today, Christian, of all things that we need to do, we need to turn our eyes towards Jesus.